Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is The Norman Invasion Part 2. In this episode, we will meet the most important character in our story and indeed arguably in the history of Ireland, the Norman Lord Strongbow. We begin today's show though where we left off in Part 1 as the King of Leinster, Dermot MacMurrah, flees Ireland in 1166. He had been thoroughly defeated earlier in the year as his only ally in Ireland, Murkertuk MacLachlan, had been killed. Dermot, however, wasn't giving up. He was heading overseas to find military aid that would restore him to power. Before we get into this fascinating show, I want to mention two upcoming tours I am organising. On July 12th and 26th, you will have the chance to travel back 700 years to the Dublin of our medieval ancestors and the often strange, sometimes violent, but always fascinating world they inhabited. If you want to book your place, go to irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash medieval tour. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash medieval tour. If those dates don't suit you or you're coming to Dublin later in the summer and would like to see what remains of medieval Dublin first hand, just contact me at Irish History on Twitter or Irish History Podcast on Facebook. But now we must go to the year 1166 and Dermot MacMurrah's flight from Ireland in search of military support. In August 1166, Dermot MacMurrah sailed into the Irish Sea. As he watched his homeland disappear behind him on the horizon, at least part of him must have wondered, would he ever return? While his exact birth date is unknown, MacMurrah was probably in his late fifties at this point. Not the time in his life to find himself back at square one, having been deposed by his enemies. Dermot had gambled in the cutthroat world of medieval Irish politics and lost. He had allied himself to Murkertoch MacLachlan, but when MacLachlan had been killed in 1166, Dermot was vulnerable to attack. After being routed on the battlefield, he was abandoned by most of his supporters. His only hope was to flee Ireland and find help elsewhere. However, on that hasty flight, things did not look good for him. The only ones to accompany him were his wife Moore, his daughter Aoife and a few attendants. Dermot, however, was not giving up. He was determined to find military aid and regain the kingship of Leinster. But this would be a hard struggle. Indeed, it was a distinct possibility that he could well end up living out his days an embittered man, living on some settlement in the Irish Sea, telling his tale of woe to anyone who would listen. There are even worse fates that could befall him in exile. In 951, Godfrey Crone, the Norse king of Dublin, had been forced out of Ireland by his rivals. He died an ignominious death in the Isle of Man from leprosy. While failure was a distinct possibility in 1166, Dermot was not simply leaving Ireland to wander the world aimlessly. He was on a quest to find allies. For nearly a century, Dermot and his ancestors, the kings of Leinster, had been trading and fighting in the wider Irish Sea region almost as much as they had in Ireland so this was a place that Dermot knew intimately well. The Irish Sea, the stretch of water between Ireland and Britain was one of the great junctions of medieval Europe. If Dermot journeyed north he could venture to the Isles of Western Scotland and perhaps find refuge among his allies there. Indeed, this was only one of several settlements across the North Atlantic. Dermot no doubt even knew of America, or Vinland as it was known in medieval Europe, a territory the Viking Leif Erikson had journeyed to around the year 1000. However, in 1166, Dermot needed allies, not adventures, so he did not head north. Instead, he looked east to England, which was part of the major military power of northwestern Europe, the Norman Angevin Empire ruled by Henry II. It was exactly one century earlier 
that the history of England had changed forever when in 1066 the Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, had invaded and conquered the Kingdom of England. William and his Norman soldiers were the descendants of Vikings who had settled in France around 900, where they had excelled in the arts of war. After their conquest of England, the power of the Normans had grown and by 1166 the reigning Norman king, Henry II, was among the most powerful men in Europe. He was not only the king of England, he was also the Count of Anjou, the Duke of the Aquitaine and the Duke of Normandy, territories that amounted to over one quarter of modern France. If anyone could reinstate Dermot, it was this man. Now, in approaching Henry, Dermot did have legitimate hopes for a positive response. He wasn't simply going to cold call the Norman king. Dermot had developed a good relationship with Henry II over the previous decades. He and his now dead ally, Mwakertoch MacLachlan, had intervened in a civil war in Scotland, supporting an ally of Henry II's, the Mormaer of Argyll, in 1160, while two years later, Dermot had fought with Henry during his campaign in the north of Wales. However, it was probably Dermot's influence over trade in the Irish Sea that would ensure he would at least be received amicably by Henry. Since 1162, Dermot had been a key player in trade between English ports and Ireland due to his control over the ports of Dublin and Wexford. Instability was bad for business and was not what Henry and more importantly, his influential merchant allies in the ports of England wanted. So Dermot had high hopes that they would want him back in power. While it was Henry who he needed to see ultimately, it was to Bristol, a city with strong trade links to Dublin, where Dermot headed initially. There he could expect to find a listening ear through the well-connected reeve of the town, Robert Fitzharding. Arive was a powerful official in a medieval town. Fitzharding no doubt had previous interactions with Dermot as the two were major players on either side of the Irish Sea. As expected, Dermot was well received in Bristol. However, this positive start was tempered by bad news. Henry II, the man who would ultimately decide Dermot's fate, was not actually in England, but instead in his territories in France and worse still, his exact location was unknown in Bristol. This was not that unusual in the medieval world. Late medieval monarchs exercised their power by constantly moving through their territories and in a world with no newspapers or telecommunications, it was pretty difficult to keep constantly up to date with Henry's movements. For Dermot, however, this was a major problem. He had to find Henry. Nothing would happen without the king's permission. But this wasn't his only concern in late 1166. The longer he spent away from Ireland, the less likely it was that he would ever be able to successfully return. His rivals back in Ireland, Rory O'Connor and his ally, Dermot's personal nemesis, Tiernan O'Rourke, would only further solidify their power in his absence. So he departed Bristol and crossed the English Channel to Normandy in the north of France, in search of Henry. However, arriving in Normandy, he learned that King Henry was in fact in his most distant territory, the Duchy of the Aquitaine in western France. As Dermot set out for the Aquitaine on what was becoming an odyssey, his self-belief that he could find allies and return to Ireland must have been wavering to some degree. He was journeying even further away from his homeland, at this point, he had travelled over a thousand miles. He had no idea what was happening at home and he had no guarantee that Henry would even help him when he found him. Arriving in the sunny climes of the Aquitaine, he finally tracked down the Angevin monarch. His upcoming meeting with Henry would decide his fate. If the king denied him assistance, Dermot would in all likelihood probably end up becoming that embittered man telling the story of how he had once been a great king. Therefore, his audience with Henry II was perhaps the single most important event in his life. While it would end up becoming probably the single most important event in nearly every person in Ireland's life, 
in the late 12th century, it did not go as Dermot had planned. When Dermot met Henry in 1166, he had little to do by way of explanation when introducing Ireland. The Norman kings of England were well aware of Ireland. A century earlier, Henry's great-grandfather, William the Conqueror, had made plans to invade Ireland, which were only cut short by his death in 1087. Indeed, in 1155, Henry himself had looked at Ireland in a similarly predatory manner. In that year, during the reign of the only English Pope, Adrian IV, Henry had secured what would become an immensely important and controversial document, the Lord Abilator, which was paper permission for Henry to take control of Ireland. It more or less gave him the right to invade Ireland in what would be a quasi-crusade. Now ultimately this hadn't happened, but Henry nonetheless still had this permission. So any invasion of Ireland would be ordained by God in effect, something that was very important in the Middle Ages. We will look at this in much greater detail in future episodes, but it suffices to say for now that Henry already had an interest in Ireland. Dermot himself went to great lengths to try and win support from Henry to restore him. Indeed, he went as far as to completely break from the society he had grown up in, in Ireland. According to the 13th century epic poem known as the Song of Dermot and the Earl, when he met Henry, Dermot proclaimed, On the condition that you be my helper, so that I do not lose all, you I shall acknowledge as sire and lord in the presence of your barns and earls. In this, Dermot was not looking to hire mercenaries from Henry, but instead he was willing to acknowledge Henry as his overlord if the king would reinstate him to power. From Dermot's perspective, he probably had little choice. When he had left Ireland, his rival, Rory O'Connor, was going from strength to strength and pretty much every king in the island had been opposed to Dermot. If he wanted to survive in Ireland, he would need to orientate himself now to another power rather than trying to find non-existent allies in Ireland. Whether he realised it at the time is not certain, but this acknowledgement of Henry as overlord would have dire and drastic consequences for Ireland in years to come. In 1166, despite this great gesture by Dermot, Henry still turned him down and would not offer him direct military support. In all reality, Henry wasn't in any position to intervene in Ireland. He was fighting on all fronts at this stage. In Aquitaine, there were several nobles threatening to defect to Louis, King of France. In Brittany, he faced a revolt, while in Wales, where the Normans had begun to conquer the country, a rebellion had broken out. It was hard the time to launch a new invasion overseas. However, Henry did give Dermot some hope when he gave him permission to recruit allies from the nobility in his territories. To aid him in this process, Henry also sent word to Fitzharding, the Reeve of Bristol, that he was to host Dermot while he sought these allies. Now arriving back in Bristol, Dermot was, in one respect, inching ever closer to a return to Ireland. Yet, at the same time, he still had to require military aid and as the weeks passed in Bristol and his overtures to Norman lords seemed to be falling on deaf ears, things did not look good for him. A military invasion of Ireland from a Norman perspective in England was a massive gamble, particularly given what Dermid was offering in return. The payment was the offer of land in Ireland, so if the venture failed, there would be no reward. It was increasingly obvious Dermid would need what were, to some degree, desperate men as he himself was getting increasingly desperate. Indeed, the first major figure who agreed to come to Ireland to fight for Dermot was a strange character, and had he had other options, I think Dermot might have rejected the offer from the Lord of Stregwil, Richard Fitzgilbert. When Dermot met the Lord of Stregwil, Richard Fitzgilbert, he may have initially felt he was scraping the bottom of the barrel. While the man was a noble, he was described by one contemporary as being great in name rather than prospects. Nor did his physical appearance come across as what we might expect of a great warrior. 
and Norman Chronicler described Richard as having a feminine face, a weak voice and a short neck. He also appears to have been quite an unassuming character, having more the air of a rank and file soldier than of a leader. This was not exactly painting the picture of a man who could win back Dermot's kingdom. However, that said, Richard Fitzgilbert did have some qualities. While Dermot could not have seen them when he met him in Bristol, the man had a legendary reputation on the battlefield. While he was a shy and unassuming individual in everyday life, he was very different in war, being described as an immovable standard round which his men could regroup and take refuge in the midst of battle. Given the dangers of coming to Ireland, he was ideal for Dermot in another aspect as well. Fitzgilbert was desperate. Since he had supported the wrong side in the English Civil War in the 1140s and fought against Henry II's mother, the Empress Maud, he had been in a political wilderness. He had no hope of political advancement in England. So he was attracted by the idea of potential glory in Ireland, particularly given that land was on offer. While he may not have initially seemed ideal, in 1166 this Norman lord, Richard Fitzgilbert and Dermot made a deal, one that was to have a life-changing impact on both men. The Lord Richard would go on to greatness, becoming the most famous individual in late medieval Ireland, known by the nickname he inherited from his father, Strongbow. Dermot, on the other hand, would gain notoriety for what he agreed to pay this Norman in return for restoring him to power in Leinster. Strongbow only agreed to fight for Dermot on the condition that he would become his heir as the King of Leinster. To bind the agreement, Dermot offered the hand of his daughter Aoife in marriage to the Norman. Now while this deal may have seemed completely legitimate to the Norman lord, Dermot may well have alluded to tell him that there was a major problem with this. Under Norman law, Strongbow's marriage to Aoife would give him standing in terms of becoming Dermot's heir. But it was meaningless back in Ireland. It was only Dermot's male relatives who could succeed him under Gaelic law. Whether Strongbow was aware of this or whether Dermot alluded to tell him is not clear. However, given that Dermot had now amassed the aid of a powerful Norman lord to fight for him in Ireland, custom and law would soon be swept aside when they arrived back in the island. What was coming in Ireland was a medieval time of iron when fire and sword would dictate what was legal and what was not and who could succeed whom. While the confusion around this would create major problems down the line, in 1166 Dermot thought about little else other than regaining power and having secured a major ally he was in a position to start thinking about returning to Ireland. Strongbow himself would not come immediately. He had many preparations to make and he first needed to attain the permission of his king, Henry II. However, Dermot could go ahead and lay the groundwork, so he wasted little time in setting out. Leaving Bristol behind him, he moved through South Wales, but before he departed for Ireland, he met another Norman noble, who although less well known than Strongbow, would play a huge role in Ireland in the coming years. South Wales in the late 12th century was not dissimilar from Ireland. War was common as local rulers were fighting the Normans for control in the region. It was in this climate that Dermot found an even more desperate man than Strongbow who was willing to help him. This was Robert Fitzstevens who had been at one point the Norman constable of Cardigan Castle. In 1167, however, he was the prisoner of the Welsh prince Rhys ap Griffith. By the time Dermot arrived, Fitzstevens was in a dire predicament. Rhys offered to release the Norman, but only on the condition that he would take up arms against King Henry II. This Robert was not willing to do, so a prisoner he remained. When MacMurrah arrived in the region, Robert's half-brother, Morris Fitzgerald, not only showed interest in Dermot's offer to come to Ireland, but he also saw it as a way to free his brother. And in 1167, he convinced the Welsh prince Rhys to free Robert Fitzstevens on the condition 
that the two would travel to Ireland to fight for Dermot. Rhys was no doubt glad to see the back of these troublesome Normans and found it an ideal solution. For Robert Fitzstevens, it was also ideal as he not only gained his freedom, but Dermot also promised him and his brother the town of Wexford and two adjoining cantreds of land, quite a substantial tract of territory if they were successful. After this deal, Dermot had now portioned off a substantial amount of Ireland to these powerful Normans. Strongbow was his heir to Leinster, while Fitzstevens and Fitzgerald were to receive Wexford. This doesn't even mention his acknowledgement of Henry II as his lord. One wonders did he begin to think of the complications that these deals would create down the line. I think given his previous actions, it's highly likely Dermot cared little about anything except his own power and prestige. And in the short term, given that he now had these Normans to support him, his star seemed set to rise and rise rapidly. While Dermot could finally set sail for Ireland in 1167, happy in the knowledge that these Normans would follow him, there were still uncertain times ahead. When he left Wales for Ireland, he was only accompanied by a tiny force of ill-prepared Normans, led by a man called Richard, son of Godibert, about whom very little is known. Whether this tiny force would be able to hold off the hostile reception Dermot would inevitably receive when he returned home was debatable. If they could and the larger force of Normans could successfully land in Ireland, it would be the entire population of Ireland who would have uncertain times ahead of them. Join me next time to see what happens as Dermot returns to Ireland and his Norman allies prepare to launch an invasion. Until next time, Slán. Thank you.